Welcome all, and thank you for being here with us today. I'm David Scobbert, Dean of Humanities at UCLA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second Possible Worlds Lecture. Possible Worlds is a collaboration between UCLA Humanities and the Bergruen Institute, an organization dedicated to sharing insights about the great transformations that are shaping our lives and our societies. The series aims to reveal and explore new ideas from today's most imaginative intellectual leaders and creators. At UCLA, we share with the Bruin Institute the conviction that ideas, including the ideas that have been transmitted and debated in various disciplines of the humanities, are what guide the continual making and remaking of our world. Now I'm pleased to introduce Nils Gilman, Vice President at the Bruin Institute. Thank you, David, and welcome to our guests. The Bergoon Institute works to develop foundational ideas for reshaping political and social institutions. With UCLA, we aim through the Possible Worlds Lecture Series to give a platform to true visionaries whose work has only just begun to shape the physical and intellectual landscape of our times. Beginning in February with our inaugural lecture, Harvard political theorist Danielle Allen, we've posed this question to our Possible Worlds thinkers. On the basis of what ideas will we be able to build a better world? Today, we have the great honor of hearing from internationally acclaimed architect Alejandro Aravena, joining us from Santiago, Chile, to speak on the following theme, how will we live together? Alejandro is the founder of the firm Elemental, a do tank that works closely with communities on projects of public interest and social impact. His architecture represents his commitment to society, resulting in works and activism that respond to social, humanitarian, and economic needs. Alejandro received the 2019 ULI J.C. Nichols Prize, the 2018 Reba Charles Jenks Award, and was the first architect uh, to receive the Gothenburg Sustainability Award in 2017. A Pritzker Architecture Prize laureate himself, he's the current president of that prize jury. We believe Alejandro's ideas will help to meet this century's challenges and the ongoing transformations of how we live and interact. I let, me, let me now turn it back over to David to talk about the program format. Thank you, Nils. Uh, directly following Alejandro's remarks, we will welcome UCLA professor Dana Cuff to moderate an interview with Alejandro. Uh, at UCLA, Professor Cuff is professor of architecture and urban design, and she's also director of City Lab, uh, which is an award-winning think tank that advances goals of spatial justice through experimental urbanism and architecture. During this part of the program, we look forward to taking questions from all of you, and you can submit those questions through the Q&A feature. Now, please join me in welcoming Alejandro Aravena. Thank you for this invitation. It's, uh, it's great uh, to be here on behalf of o Elemental. Um, just a quick introduction about the title, uh, How Will We Live Together? Uh, this is uh, the title of this year's uh, Venice Biennale, curated by Hashim Sarkis. And, um, it, it was supposed to happen uh, in 2020, but uh, due to the pandemic, it was postponed. Yet the title, even though it was before the pandemic, it's, it's very valid uh, nowadays. It, and it's a very broad question of, of the friction. And the, no, there's no doubt there are many benefits in living together and concentrated in space in cities. Yet there are some threats and challenges that we have to address. Um, and when invited to present at the Biennale, uh, at the time in Chile, the issue, the biggest conflict by far was between Chileans and Mapuche, those, uh, the native uh, population of the southern part of the country. Uh, and there's, there was a, a, every, every single day in, on the news, and uh, there was these uh, uh, issues about the violence escalating. Um, but I, I would say that that title uh, that was applied just to that conflict nowadays, in, in a year where Chile has uh, exploded. The, we are discussing a new constitution, so new rules of the game for how we will live together. Um, and all the crises that throughout the world are going on, it may be a pertinent way or lens to look uh, through which look at the challenges of our society. So uh, I would like to start with a, a very short video uh, that we prepared for the Biennale. Uh, we were asked, given it was postponed, to create this kind of trailer or sneak peek into the content. Uh, and this has been circulating in the internet. And with that, uh, we can then be, uh, begin to discuss about these uh, added dimensions of the question of how we will live together. So 
please, if the video can run now. Mapuche and Chileans have always been in conflict. At the core is the question of the land. One possible clue to understand the complexity of the issue may be given by the fact that in Spanish we don't have two words for land and earth. So we have tended to mix, as if it was the same thing, the dispute over the land, its ownership and the historical property rights, with a deeper notion of Earth as planet. Be it for legal or cultural reasons, the fact is that violence has escalated. So, how we will live together. First, by getting to know each other. The Kunu intends to use architecture as a portal to the Mapuche world. Once the field is leveled, let's start a conversation. The Coyahue is a place that intends to reinstall the old tradition of Paulus. Puede ser un camino, no estamos diciendo que ese un camino, puede ser una Alejandro, uh, that video is very powerful. Maybe you could just say a little bit more about the origins of the kunu. Is that the name for the ring of poles that you're shaping there? Yes, and um, so a, a little bit of the of, of how we we arrived here. Um, so, as I was saying before, there's the, the biggest conflict in 2019 before the social explosion and by the end of 2019 was Mapuche, then it kind of uh, went down under the, this other tension we had in the country that led us to rewrite our constitution. We are voting this next weekend uh, for who will write in the next constitution. So, it, so the tension arrived to that point that we need to rewrite the rules of the, uh, of the game that uh, will allow hopefully to uh, make us peacefully coexist. Um, but now over time, and I may share now some my, my screen because I do have some images and, and for the people to know, we will talk about this and eventually then move to other projects that will have the same question uh, as, a, as a possible challenge. Um, so we will quickly, uh, yeah. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, not quite full screen yet. I will go to that one second. Yeah. Perfect. So the, the Mapuche, it's um, Che in, in Mapusungun, which is the, the language uh, means people and uh, Mapu, earth. And I, as the, the video was saying, there, there's, there's many dimensions uh, to the conflict. Uh, yet the earth, the, the land, the, the property, it's at the core. Uh, that's ultimately the, the reason why we have this, the, these tensions. Uh, and well, maybe in, in the video, this is it's just a trailer of the thing. Um, Mapuche are a, a nation or a, um, that 
had the tradition of parlies. They, they were having parlies to deal with the rules of the game for how to coexist in a territory with the Inca Empire before 1500, uh, but then with the Spanish crown, uh, then we, with Chile. Actually, uh, when Chile uh, became an independent state in, in 1810, uh, they were recognized as a nation and they had these parlies. And uh, those parlies ended up in treaties. So they were recognized uh, from, by the Chilean Republic at the very beginning. And we thought, well, if there's a tradition in finding a way to deal with the controversies, with, uh, with, the, with the tensions, when one possibility could be uh, to reinstall that old tradition. There's on the, on the left side, there's an old engraving. Uh, the, of course, this is a kind of an assumption of how they could look like. It, it's clear that it's not true. I mean, the geography here it doesn't exist like that. The parties were have it happening actually in the farther south, where there's a forest, there's a never kind of a plain. And also the, the architecture there is kind of invented. It couldn't have existed. So we, our challenge was, well, let's create a place for these parties to be able to take place again. Um, and in the process of understanding, and, and, and this may be important, uh, given there's such a deep history of conflicts where, where the, the, the question is so charged, in order to start, it was crucial that we unlearned what we thought we knew about the conflict. So we said, okay, let's go into the territory, immerse ourselves uh, with uh, empty, empty eyes, with empty mind, and see what's there from scratch once again. And in that process of, of unlearning and relearning, um, there was this, uh, this woman, Veronica Fuentes, that said, but you know that into what was important in the old tradition of parties, um, a minimum symmetry of knowledge between the parties. So before going into the, the ritual of the parley, all the parties had to know each other. And there was some time that was needed for that uh, mutual knowledge. So the Kunu, <clears throat> it, given it was, it started from a project that the Mapuche wanted and with a, with a huge list of, of programs, we thought, well, maybe this is an opportunity to level that field. Maybe through this project, that is, it, it's kind of a small city, more than a big building, we can we can take advantage of it and, and make it become that portal, that bridge to get to know each other and live in the field and only then be able to parley whatever needs to be discussed between, between Chile and Mapuche. So what used to be in our thought, a one-step process, let's create a place to parley, required a previous step, which is the kunu for uh, leveling the field between the parleys. Um, and just a couple of images, and then I'll stop sharing the screen. Uh, of This is, a, in a nutshell, a process that has been going on for a couple of years now. Uh, but this is how it looks uh, nowadays. Um, there's a, a, a documentary that we're preparing. Unfortunately, I cannot share it at the moment. With I mean, This is a very delicate matter, I and mean, we can't just communicate whatever comes out of this process without being careful and being polite to the part to the parties here and uh, but just for you to know that we're in the process of, of telling the story and, and how important to, to tell the story will be uh, from now on so uh, yeah that that for now the um, political fragility of all of this seems like it's embodied in the uh, sort of framework of that loose basket kind of weave of the kunu. Was that a, a traditional building practice or was that something that was a participatory project? How did you arrive at that form? It's a, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I think this must have been the most challenging projects we have ever uh, faced in our professional life uh, because it was a complete unknown territory. I mean, the, the, I mean if, if the creative act 
it's always a jump into the void. Here, the void and the gap between what we knew and was and what could be was huge. So um, I would say that that uh, as never before in, in our professional life, intuition here played a very big role where you gather information without knowing that you know those, those uh, aspects. Of course, and learning was important so that we emptied any kind of, of preconceived uh, answer before we understood the question. Uh, we were listening, the in between the lines are crucial, uh, body language, language is important. Uh, so, because one thing is, is what you get as, the, as a formal text, but what's underneath we felt was, was more important. Um, so actually, and one of the challenges in here was the fact that this is, in, it starts from a forest company. Part of the conflict here is those that own the land, land nowadays are the biggest ones that are, are blamed for, for the conflict are forest companies and Mapuche communities. And in here, uh, th there's no negotiation in some other parts of the country. There's just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of war. Uh, but in this particular place, there was a little window that these communities say, okay, let's see if we can explore a different path. Uh, and because of that, they, they approached each other and, and they approached us to see if we could provide with some design uh, to create the, or help or contribute to the rapprochement. And in that process, the community of, of Loncoche had this expectation of a big, a big building where they wanted to have a cultural center, a place for the, the local leaders to meet, uh, a small hotel to be able to uh, accommodate communities that were coming to cities for, for, I don't know, go to the healthcare center or uh, but also productive issues like a, a market and a place to uh, teach the language. So it, it has a huge amount of programs. Um, and they actually had a design. Uh, so we said, okay, uh, what we're hearing here, it's very hard to, be, to become a reality right, just like that. And uh, so our, our struggle, our internal struggle was, I mean, if we want to manage expectations and, and don't make false promises that then we cannot keep, it's, it's, it's clear that that big building is, is unable to become a reality just like that. It's a question of, of timing, budget, I mean, many issues. I mean, is it, but if we just say no to be res professionally responsible, uh, then, it, the chances of, okay, just another evidence that says that the Westerners, the Winkas are not listening to the Mapuche needs. So it, it was a very delicate balance between being responsible, but being at the same time receptive. Uh, so we thought, how do we come out of this trap? And we said, well, why don't we introduce some time into the, que the question, why don't we make all those programs in sequence instead of all at once? And if the, this incremental approach to the design is the case, this looks more like a small city, more than a big building. And if the city is the case, this requires a foundational act. So the KUNU, we, when we went back south to present after, after swallowing all the information and, and studying and understanding the, the question and, and actually designing the question, we went back south to present. We were extremely nervous. I, I still remember that day because we were very conscious that what we were presenting and proposing was not what they were expecting. Yet, we intuitively knew that this was prop, I mean, pertinent for the question. So that Kunu, that it's, it's a foundational act of a city that then over time will have all their, what they are requesting. Uh, 
And because of that, it may work as this kind of breach into the Mapuche world, not just to satisfy the needs that they were, that were very clear, but they may serve a, a bigger purpose, that of, of leveling the field, of the mutual knowledge, the symmetry of knowledge between the part, parties that eventually is not guaranteed may go into a party. I'm really interested in your kind of rethinking of what architecture is and can deliver, that it's the obvious first step was, oh, let's have a giant building as if that's what architecture is. But instead, you brought something like a temporal understanding, a process, but still there's an investment that is the labor and building uh, of architecture that offers a certain kind of trust that I think if you just put a table for a conversation, wouldn't demonstrate the same kind of convictions. And that must be part of what you're building when you're saying you're managing expectations, that you're really building trust by investing your time and labor into the project. And I would say that the, the common thread here is that uh, whenever there is a complex question, the scarcest resource is synthesis. And at the very core of architecture, there's a very powerful tool, a very uh, synthetic tool, which is the design. A design organizes all the information in a proposal key. And um, so that's why we, that, that's where the, the role of, of intuition, I mean, when, when looking and, and remembering the meetings, there was this particular leader, Mario Mila, that was drawing in the air with the hand. So he had a form in the back of his hand, and uh, we're bringing that in the, into this documentary. We have the footage, fortunately, about that moment where he was doing this kind of circular form with the hand. And of course, this, the circle is an, an important um, uh, translation into space and, and place of, uh, of some forces at play. I have to say, I mean, I, I won't be able to, to talk about all the dimensions here, but just to name one, Mapuche is an oral culture. It's not a written culture. Mm -hmm. And in oral court cultures, I mean, gathering around somebody speaking, it has a man maximum uh, width. You can't be that far. It, it tends to be towards the center, uh, for example. Another dimension that is not, it doesn't have a translation into space, but explains, I would say, many of the, the the conflicts that we are, we hardly get as Westerners. In a written culture, you write down history, and the moment you write it down, you can put it in the memory in the back. Uh, in an oral culture, things that happened 150 years ago is, have, is like they have happened yesterday. So if there was a treaty that was not uh, honored, well, you, you are not complying with the 1825 Treaty of Tapiwe. And that is like Chileans would say, yeah, but that happened 200 years ago. Well, for an oral culture, it's like yesterday. So the circular form is at the, is at the base in, in, in uh, oral cultures. It's a kind of natural form, unlike the square of the Spanish foundational uh, town. But the fact that is oriented east for, for Mapuche culture, where the sun rises is important. I still remember that very first meeting where we came with this, this model that was this, this kind of sketch, 3D sketch with just sticks. And because we felt some vertical was needed, vertical to make the, the issue visible. And Mapuche is a, is a culture that doesn't necessarily have a civic architect, architecture. They may have domestic architecture, but not civic, or they do have religious architecture, but not civic one. So we thought, well, maybe we take those traces and instead of them disappearing into uh, rituals that only last for a couple of hours or days, let's make them last so that they're visible. That's why the vertical and that's why the caliber of the elements, they're trees, not just wood. Uh, but we said, okay, we, we kind of get that the East is important and we brought this model to the meeting. Uh, and we present the model. And um, of course, they, there was a, an a Eureka moment. They said, that's it. We, we know that's that's not what we asked for, but for some reason, that's it. Um, not any of us, not us, not them knowing what it was, but this un unspeakable certainties, you know, when, when you know something that you just can't express, express it with words. But the second reaction was, but it's wrong. 
you know, because this is oriented east. And we said, yeah, but that's what we understood. Uh, it was important for the Mapuche culture. Yeah, but this is going to be mainly used for the New Year ceremony, the Wetipantu, that takes place between 21st and 24th of June. And in that date, the sun is not east, it's slightly mm -hmm. off. And so we said, okay, uh, move it. The model was on purpose, not glued. So it was just part that they could move and then reoriented slightly the circle to fit because the amount of perimeter of the circle had to be enough to accommodate 80 fires out of the 80 communities that would gather through the new year, uh, the Huetripanto celebration. So they slick, slightly moved the thing. Um, and that's what we're saying that even though it's very simple, as you noted, is, is not for the less is more of that yeah. we, in, it's for the more or less, is, is more or less a circle, is more or less oriented east. And, and that more or lessness allows for design become a dialogue. We may know some things, they know others. And the, the challenge here was uh, this, knowledges converge. That, that's how we, we kind of enter the, the, the process. There's a question from the audience that uh, is a complicated one. I wonder if you could address it, which is they're wondering if this model of parleys and um, sort of overcoming misunderstandings in order to undo violence in the world more broadly, could this scale up, do you think, to uh, more global conflicts uh, or other kinds of conflicts outside of the indigenous people and Chilean people? It, I would say it's only a guess and actually it's even a bet. Uh, but my intuitive answer again would, would be yes. And the reason is that at the very beginning of this project, by far uh, the, the biggest conflict was between Chileans and Mapuche. Mm -hmm. Then the social explosion in October 2019 created this huge, huge tension. I mean, and I, I do have some images afterwards for other projects that I would like to share about the, the level of, of, of violence. Uh, and who would have thought that the, in this process of, okay, let's find a way to uh, work out our controversies and, and differences, that the Mapuche, which were the highest conflict, may offer a clue to solve the problem, not between Mapuche and Chileans, but between Chileans, the rich and the poor, the left and the right, the have and the have nots. Um, so the notion and, and this process, okay, if we want to talk about our differences and be able to create a, a rules of the game that allow to live together, going back to the question, well, let's start by know each other. And of course, the kind of cultural ignorance between Westerners and Mapuche, uh, that was that far that one is an oral culture, another one is a written culture. It was less obvious between Chileans, but one of the things that became pretty clear in the inequalities that the country is living, uh, under which the country is living, is that the rich didn't know how poor the poor were, how, how awful the living situation of the poor was. So it was like, why are they so angry? Why are they going and, and rioting on the streets? Well, if you knew what is to live under the conditions of, of in which they're living, well, at least you would say, well, no wonder the, the anger, resentment is accumulated. Of course, the moment this kind of lack of presence of the state or, or democracy, uh, that is in a kind of wild west there in the peripheries, then drug trafficking takes over. I mean, the, the other forces that arrive where the state cannot arrive, and then the rules of the game there are different. Uh, the law of the strongest one and not the ones that takes care of the common good, for example. But again, this may be a clue for how we between Chileans find the way to parley. And if if it, 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 tra it transited from Mapuche and Chileans to Chileans between Chileans, I would yeah. say that in principle, the moment you get to know, so that the other, the moment you don't know the other, and in the pandemic is that the others became a threat. I mean, the moment I don't know somebody, 
it's a threat that it, I can get sick because of that. So I guess that for many different reasons, get to know the other party and only then go into a conversation because it may open the possibility that you change your mind. If you don't know each other, there's no possibility that you will just keep on defending your, your initial uh, points. Well, it, what you're saying is so applicable in the city of Los Angeles today because we are facing this huge divide between our unhoused neighbors and those who live in houses. And though the presence of uh, homelessness is with us every day, there's so little conversation that we really have a lack of understanding. And the possibility in my mind that an architecture as well as an understanding of history, both learning and relearning um, is very promising. Uh, do you wanna move on to the next project where you talk Let's, about some of those issues in another- Yes, I think it, 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 from a different angle, it addresses the same issue. So Great. let's go to that. Yeah, so this is the, the again, I mean, a kind of unexpected possibility of how to create a, an understanding uh, with the headquarter of a bank, the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, so the, this project started with a request from the IDB that wanted to build a regional office in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And um, if they would have followed, let's say business as usual, uh, that was pretty much the, the, could have been the case, they would have built a tower in the financial, one of the financial districts of Buenos Aires. But there was a very bold move by the president of the IDB at the time, Luis Moreno, that said, no, you know, we want to build our headquarters in the biggest favela of Buenos Aires, Barrio 31. I'm talking about here of 50,000 people living uh, informally in this settlement right across the richest neighborhood in Buenos Aires. So he said, Moreno, um, we finance projects of different nature, sanitation or, or whatever it is. And then, can we ask our own building to trigger the same amount of development that we expect from the project we finance? So that's why we would like to have it in the, in the center of, of Barrio 31 instead of going to the financial uh, district. That was the origin of the project. And for you to have an idea, uh, this is how Barrio 31 looks like. Uh, all this informal, informal living, but I guess one of the reasons that on North Earthquake in Buenos Aires, unlike in Chile, you, it has grown to three, four, four or five levels. Uh, so a very compact and dense living, uh, not only around the highway, there are actually people living underneath the highway in, in very bad conditions. And here you see the superimposition of, of properties and that explains that high density, actually more than density, this is overcrowding. It's, it's unacceptable living conditions. And, and one of the challenges, one of the, uh, to make the problem even, even worse, that all those 50,000 people could go in and out of this slum just through one point where the red arrow is. So there was this kind of, uh, the, the moment people wanted to go to work on the other side of the, into the formal city, they all had to go to that red arrow and then back into the city, only walking, not even to public transportation was a possibility for them. So in, in average, one hour walk, walking in order to have access to jobs. And this is important. Why do people come into cities? Well, because cities concentrate opportunities. It's not just an accumulation of houses. Of opportunities of, of better jobs, of education, access to healthcare, to sanitation, even recreation. That's why people come into cities. Um, the problem is that if we cannot accommodate them properly, then when people arrive, they're segregated from those opportunities. And here is where that social ticking time bomb begins to accumulate pressure in a way. So there was a plan from the World Bank and the IDB itself trying to remove some barriers, mainly the highway that, that went through the core of this, the neighborhood. 
And when we were called, we said, okay, fine, but there's another barrier that is even more important. Actually, the city of Buenos Aires called this the river of trains, the, all the railroads that prevented this neighborhood to be connected, even though they were very close. You from one side could look into the richest part of the neighborhood, yet you couldn't go through this uh, river of trains. So the IDB said, let's try to trigger some development and have our project placed into the in the in the neighborhood so again trying to um, look with empty eyes and completely and, and learning whatever it was a bold and of course very attractive move but we wanted to test if it's what it was going to trigger that desired development or not and so we began to put some conditions to the design it will have to be elevated so that it even complies with the uh, standards of the IDB to build their offices, uh, natural light, views, and ventilation in a crowded neighborhood. Uh, it would not even pass the board meeting for how the living conditions for the workers uh, were going to be. So one condition to be up. It also was necessary because the only available space was a very tiny empty lot, and it would have been a very bad gesture uh, that you arrive with a building and occupy, if there's a scarce resource in the slum that's open public space, and the only one may have been occupied by a building. So in case we build there, it will have to be elevated, not to uh, and, and, yeah, misuse this, this very valuable resource of, of public space. Some connection will have to be created. There was no connection. So a couple of vehicular roads, at least two for security reasons following uh, the standards of the IDB and, and at least a pedestrian bridge over the, the railway so that the staff could have access to public transportation. The problem with this is that all these operations were outside the boundaries of the slum and the city had no power, so they could not finance that. And in any case, it would be something that the city would have to finance before the IDB put their building in place. So our proposal or counter proposal to the IDB was what if we transform all, all of the four conditions that we were asking the city into the condition of the designs, the design of the building? Why don't we build that make the building itself be the bridge? In that case, we are not occupying valuable land. We are building into the air. Uh, we are providing a connection. So one, one end of the, of the bridge being in the formal city, it's naturally connected to public transportation, parking out of the question, we're already connecting to the existing network. Um, it's elevated because it will have to be elevated to allow trains to go underneath. So let's make the building all the constraints that it used to have. And actually, and this was a, an, this is how the, the, we've, we began to work in the further development of the, of the building. We were working with a, a, a very fine structural engineer company from Germany. Um, and they said, you know, the span, I'm, I'm talking about here a 240 meter long building. This is by three, three 700 and 500 feet long building. And the span was 110 meters in between the columns because it, the, the world and railway. So 300 feet span. And the engineer said, yeah, we can span that. Uh, from a static point of view, but you know the problem here is going to be the vibration. You know, in a bridge, in a bridge, you normally don't notice the vibration if you're going driving in in a car. But if you're working there, it will be very uncomfortable. So we need weight. The weight, instead of something to be avoided, in this case, is something that is desirable. And that's why we say, well, if we have a park on top of the building, it adds weight, but also increases what is the the scarcest resource in the slum, which is public space. So the park on, in the roof was the, was the problem, was a solution for a problem. Um, and by putting the bridge over there, the current situation of within one hour walk, walking, this is the amount of, of the radius of, of jobs available or education facilities, culture, recreation, healthcare, uh, within one hour walk, by placing the uh, bridge over there, that radius multiplied by four, if not more, all the access to the opportunities that cities concentrate. So it became a shortcut 
towards the services that, that cities offer in a way. Uh, of course, this was a hard sell to the IDB because we had to convince staff that this was the place where, where they had to work. And of course, that was a very bad scenario because it's at the pedestrian level, but once you are hiked at plus 18 meters, it's, it's, it's not that hard sell. And, and this, I guess, it began to, to find the gap or a way for, for the client to accept the building. Uh, and then, of course, the, the amount of development that it triggers uh, on top of it, the, the park on top, that will connect the formal with the informal city, and eventually even at night to create this kind of, of lamp or, or safety is a, is a big issue here. Uh, and again, so through a very specific operation, we thought we could uh, change the forces at play uh, in the city. There was just one minor question that was not that minor, which is a law had to be passed in the Congress to be able to use the air rights on top of the railroads. Because for legal, I mean, this is a, it's a, it's a federal country, so the, the railroads are owned by the nation, not by the city, and there was no precedent in using air rights. Um, so we had to vote to go to the Congress. And, and in normal circumstances, this would have been a no-go. Normally between city and nation, and mayor and, and president are, are in, in a fight and tend to block uh, each other. But in this particular case, and, and I, this I see again as a, not only the parlies as a way to find uh, a way for how to answer the question, how we will live together, but eventually design and city itself as a shortcut towards equality explains why when we went into the voting, uh, this project was approved by 40 against 12 votes in the Congress. And that was an unprecedented in the in the political history of, of uh, Buenos Aires. Another amazing project. At the other extreme, formally, from what you showed initially, but I think in terms of the intentions, uh, there are a lot of overlaps. There's another question that's coming from the audience that I think uh, would be interesting to hear you speak about. And that is what you hope that bridge building will catalyze as it moves ahead. The question, the question was raised as, do you think it will trigger gentrification? And of course, that's a kind of concern we have in cities in the United States today that are all being speculated uh, upon for higher density, more luxurious development. But I don't know quite what that would mean in Barrio 31. Um, yes. Uh, well, you know, a project like this, it's it's full of tensions. I mean, the, the ones that were opposing this project was the rich, rich neighborhood to the right of the of the picture. I mean, now we are going to be exposed to this kind of threat of all those people living in, in former in illegal immigrants. Half of the population of the slum is immigrants. So the fear was a big force here. How how do you deal with that? And and I guess and. and Unfortunately, coming from Chile, uh, we, we could talk to Argentinians by saying, look, do not make the same mistake that we already made. Because mm -hmm. by placing them somewhere there where you don't see it, right. then the ticking time bomb there is accumulating a pressure that you would like to address as early as possible. Do not pre because it's going to happen anyhow. That was the, one of the forces at, at, at play. There was, as I was saying, some investment being done by the World Bank and by the IDB, and it was about eliminating the highway, uh, providing sanitation, but mainly, and this is the, the, the most important thing in, in informal settlements, is the rule of law to provide legal property rights on where you live. And, and this is by, that's why you want to prevent informal slums to be formed in the first place. There's a, a, a a, a race, uh, the, the speed is needed because the moment you enter that level of informality and do that is very, very difficult. So even with very fragile uh, provisional, uh, just sanitation, if you have at least some notion of what who belongs to what, those other issues are um, 
have a better chance to be addressed in the future. So if for some reason gentrification happens and people own their land, there's not a landlord, it, it, it's a micro ownership of thousands of owners, then the ones that are going to benefit from the potential luxury thing will be the uh, owners themselves. So the issue is who owns the land. We have had the same issue in one in the social housing projects that we do, you know, in the in the developing world, and this is a different condition from the US. Housing policies tend to be property oriented. The moment you receive a subsidy, you become the owner of the house. So housing is not just a way to protect you and shelter you from the environment. Actually, it's the biggest transfer of, of money from public funds into a family asset. And one would like that money to perform the same way all of us expect a property to perform, which is to gain value over time. In principle, housing is an investment, it's not a social expense, but that's not the case in social housing, unfortunately. It's closer to buy a car than to buy a property. So we dealing with subsidies in Chile, that is a, is a transfer into a family asset, what we have been expecting is to grow its value over time, building in the, in the center of cities. I mean, when you have scarce resources, you have to prior, establish priorities. And by far, I prefer to spend a dollar in a more expensive piece of land than in an extra square meter of a house. Because if you're integrated in the network of opportunities of cities and you keep your job, for example, while getting a housing subsidy, then you may be able to improve your household. If you're expelled to the peripheries, then the chances for you to use your house as an economical tool and not just as a roof against the, as a shelter against the environment are very low. So we were saying, and we were, the, the same question was raised for our first projects. And by the way, and I may just show, because we're, I, I think we had just 10 minutes here, so I won't be able to show everything in, in, uh, in housing. Let me share the screen again. And by the way, I think it, I, I made this exercise some time ago. I Googled social housing in English, and, and this is what comes out. When you Google vivienda social in Spanish, this is what comes out. So I guess that when, when we say social housing, that it may explain why we have different things in the back of our minds. Uh, when you type lack of housing, this is what, uh, of course, this may be my algorithm, uh, yet what appears when I type lack of housing in English, it's mainly homeless. When you type falta de vivienda, lack of housing in Spanish, it's slums. Um, so I'm, I'm just uh, going to, to explain this uh, equation that we were required to, to solve back in 2003, when we started with the social housing initiative. And we were asked to provide a housing solution for 100 families that were illegally occupying a half an hectare site. It says 5,000 square meters. I don't know how to translate in acres, but uh, in, in any case, that, that's the, the number, using a subsidy of $7,500. That was the public policy. And with those $7,500, we had to buy the land provide the infrastructure and sanitation and build the house. And in a pretty efficient market like the Chilean one, that meant 30 square meters. And uh, the, the place I'm talking about is here, a very complex situation about the, the drug trafficking in the, but yet the city around was highly desirable to be maintained because there are where the opportunities, and this was expressed in the, in the cost of the land, that was three times more than what social housing could afford. In here, this is the city where we made this first project in Iquique. And you see Iquique is a, this kind of grid close to the beach. Uh, it's a free port. Social housing, the uh, land being the scarcest resource was not being built for some decades uh, in 2003. And it was being built in this other place in Alto Hospicio where the poor were accumulated because their land cost nothing. I'm talking about 800 meter drop 
from that high plateau to the city. That means in a rather small city, uh, a 45 minute commute that for the family economy is a disaster. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm just pointing out that and I'm going to jump to the last slide here because this is a, a very complex animal in here. So the project we built that of course, because that amount of money of $7,500, you can't build everything. And what do you do when you on day one don't have the time nor the money to build the middle-class standard that you would like to? Well, our, our response or alternative to scarcity was incrementality. Let's, let's allow that an open system over time achieves that middle-class standard that you cannot deliver on day one because of, of the uh, scarce public resources. Actually, out of that $7,500 subsidy, it was a voucher composed by $7,200 of direct subsidy of the state plus $300 of family saving. So for the family, that household was, let's say, purchased by, for $300. 10 years later, if you go there to the Quinta Monroy, you can buy it for $70,000. And the, the reason of this value gain is because everybody wants to be close to jobs, good schools, even to the beach, and not up there in, the, in that periphery in, in Alto Spicio. And, and you see in here that, that apartment building expresses how uh, valuable the land is, and that, that's the pressure for wanting to live there. So the risk of gentrification, of course, was here. The families that sold this now are citizens in the sense that they, they never chose. They were given everything. So finally, through housing, at least family do have an economical tool where they can choose. Some of them choose to stay because they know they will inherit the property to their children and it's very valuable. They won't find another alternative, uh, but they, they own the land. And there are others that decided because the children went out, they're an, an older couple. The thing is that they're now people that is able to choose. Before that, living illegally, you can't choose. You're in, if you're lucky, you're given stuff. This goes directly to a question from Deborah Weintraub, who's an architect in the city, um, who's asking, and it was about Barrio 31, but I think it applies right here, that uh, do you engage in conversations about how to control the speculation of land value that happens once these projects are installed? Or is that not the issue, uh, is what I'm gathering from what you're saying? Well, that's the kind of thing we would worry about deeply here. Yeah, I, I would say that one has to work in parallel here because at the public policy level, and that's what we call elemental a do tank, not a think tank, yes. uh, but it, you can't avoid being a think tank in the sense that we use design and projects to test where you hit a wall in a public policy and then go back with, let's say, your, your think tank helmet and see how can you change the rules of the game to prevent, for example, land speculation. But in the meantime, you cannot wait until those rules have changed, until doing something in a relatively small country. Uh, since the beginning of Elemental and now, two million subsidies have been given away. And, and unless you can do better uh, with the existing rules of the game, then you're, I guess, that you're, you're just waiting too long and you're not doing anything against that ticking time bomb that is accumulating. So what we do now is understand all the constraints okay, price of the land is X, cost of construction is Y, density need. And, and the, I would say here that the, the way design we have found around is a triad that is dense enough, low rise uh, designs so that you can pay for expensive land, but be, given they are low rise, they're prepared for a worst case scenario. Let's say when you build high, and people stop paying for the maintenance of the elevators or the uh, electric bulb in the corridor, they go into the spiral of deterioration. Of course, the, the, there's a very high chance for that to happen in socially fragile environments. So the low rise in a way, even in a worst case scenario can kind of resist. 
still you want to achieve enough density to pay for expensive land. And in average, we are able to pay for three times more than what social housing can afford. In, in a city like Santiago, that, me, that means 20,000 hectares that are invisible if you just go for business as usual and without introduce design as a tool uh, to find a way around. But anyway, high and dense enough low rise buildings with, without overcrowding, this is very important, with the possibility of expansion. Because this is the other thing, evidence shows that the process of growth stops at around 80 to 90 square meters. If with a public policy, you can deliver 40, then those other 40 are going to be built anyhow. It, it, it's a fact, it will happen. The problem is when it happens despite design and not thanks to design. When you have these big forces of, of self-construction, I mean, it's a, such a strong force that you better channel that instead of repressing or pretending Yo, you're not going to be able to resist that. So channel that force and make it become part of the solution, not part of the problem. If I put a, a, a clear, neat frame for that self-construction to take place, then I'm taking advantage of a, th a third source of, of uh, funding. In addition to a state and the market, there's family resources that can be channeled in here. And uh, so the question is, within that set of rules, you go into the market and are able to buy land that is three times more expensive than you can normally afford. In parallel, of course, one of the discussions in the new constitution now in Chile is, okay, let's create a bank of land so that we can reserve or public, publicly owned land. But I would say we will always be, it's going to be a moving target. Uh, and we, and, well, this, this is still at the very, very early stage here because um, I, I can't even have a show a, a picture. Uh, we're working in this right now because the question of the land is so crucial mm -hmm. that if we keep on looking at land as though in, in those empty lots that are still available in the city, we're never not, not to, going, going to scratch the deficit of housing. I'm talking about half a million units that are needed, not only of the new families in here, but the stock that we already built is obsolete. It, 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 it had no capacity to accompany a family while going from slum to social housing to middle class. They, they were stopped somewhere halfway. And this explains again, the pressure that was accumulated in that social city that we built in the past decades. So we thought, where do we look for land in here? And, um, and we thought that the land is not in the land, but in the air, in the air between the roof of those social housing units that were built in the past. I'm talking about one to two stories, maximum height. It's very low dense social housing city. And the maximum that the building codes allowed that is around four floors. So in between the two floors that are already there and the four maximum floors, there's 20, uh, there's 3000 um, hectares of um, possible potential land that is in the hand of hundreds of thousands of owners. So if the, the realtor here, the, the real estate is going to be the real popular real estate, the democratic real estate that is micro owned by hundreds of thousands of, of owners that are going to eventually, we're, we're, we're working on that, it, um, that they will be able to build three to four units and in their own land, allow housing to make it become an income for themselves. Uh, so maybe the, the, the solution for the land speculation, if it happens, well, let's make sure that it will benefit hundreds of thousands of users that will need it and not just the big capital and, and the big uh, building companies or the, the real estate companies. Uh, Alejandro, I feel like we could listen to your insights for a lot longer, but we've run out of time. Yes. Uh, they're amazing projects. You're not just leading Chilean uh, insight and creativity, but really, I think for all of us, it, that taking architecture as a humanist pursuit is so apparent in the work you've shown us and that it results in a beautiful 
new cities is something that's uh, an added gift to all of that. So thank you so much for being with us today. I also want to thank Welcome. the Bruin Institute and the Division of Humanities. And I would invite everyone from the audience to join us again in the fall when we have our next uh, uh, lecture series, next lecture in the lecture series about world changing ideas. Thanks, Alejandro Arbena. You're welcome. Ciao.